Welcome to episode 103 about the with the hard truth about B2B e-commerce. Uh, I'm already struggling to, I think it's the the getting over a hundred. It's it's making it harder to uh <laughs> to make the intro as I say the larger numbers. Um, but yeah, pass it back to you, Tim. Yeah, I mean it is. It's is it 103 or 103, or you know, we have to figure <laughs> out how we want to how we want to say this going forward, but uh yeah, it's, it's exciting. I have to say, I got a lot of messages from people congratulating us on making it to 100. And, and I'm very, you know, happy that we have and we'll just keep going. I mean, who knows? We'll maybe we'll be around for a thousandth episode. I have no idea you know, how many. That's the, is that the, the Joe Rogan's try? Where is he? He's at what? Thousands or something? He's, like he's, he does one like every five minutes. He does a podcast. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to. I think they put a number that. about it. It's some ridiculous number, like 3,521 or something like that. I mean, I guess if that were our full time job, we would have yeah. a thousand podcasts. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's it's great to be episode 103. Uh, and I usually do shout outs to people, but this week I want to mention uh, that we're doing a live uh, interview. Uh, and we're going to be doing it at Digital Commerce Today in Boston on September 6th. Uh, and uh, we're going to be interviewing Bill Mirabito. Uh, and it's going to be a great conference. So if people hear this, 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 ep pop, ep bleh, I can only say it, this podcast episode will be out before that event. So if people are interested in attending, contact me, contact Isaiah. Uh, we will help uh, get you into that event in Boston on September 6th. Uh, we also have a uh, wonderful comedy performance that's at Laugh Boston. So should be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to have a great time. So please join us if you can. Uh, and that is that pitch for today. And I'm just going to pause for a moment so that uh, our folks can insert the sponsor mentions. And I'll throw it back to Isaiah to introduce our guests. Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works well for you and for your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com. Book a session and tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform for B2B e-commerce, 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. Um, Is that it? Or back to you. Yeah, I'm excited <laughs> to introduce uh, Ed Kennedy, Senior Product Manager at Adobe. It's kind of a funny story. He commented on one of my B2B e-commerce posts and I looked uh, looked up your background and I was like, hey, this guy, you know, Ed, you, you know a lot about uh, commerce and, and b2b and you know would love to have you and uh you know glad that you're here so thank you for yeah it's nice to be here i've learned more about b2b commerce in one lifetime that i care to forget um <laughs> it's definitely been um yeah a long journey into the depths of what <laughs> b2b commerce means for businesses <laughs> it is a complicated topic right and i think that's why we started this podcast is that you know if you go look at ecom podcasts, you'll find, you know, eight bajillion, you know, D to C, you know, Shopify podcasts and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I've listened to some of them and it's, you know, a lot of things about getting new customers and kind of your, your traditional kind of marketing tactics and whatnot. But there's not a lot of information about B2B e-commerce. So tell, how did you learn? Like how, uh, one of the things we've struggled with is just finding people that have a lot to talk about because there's not as many experts as you would think in the field. So like, how did you get this knowledge? Um, it... Well, I started my career doing implementations of e-commerce platforms, okay. um, you know, Oracle, Magento, um, Hybris. And so doing all those implementations, you just as the market shifted from retail to brands to distributors now to manufacturers yeah um you just followed i followed that wave um and then i started working for uh optimizely on their cms and commerce product doing b2b implementations for manufacturers and 
then kind of boomeranged back to the Adobe Commerce or Magento ecosystem. So it's just like collecting so many um, travel miles, going and <laughs> seeing companies hmm. in their very unique conference rooms, trying to figure out how they're going to do B2B e-commerce. Because uh, for so many companies, it's their first generation e-commerce implementation or their second generation and they're finally starting to take it more seriously um so yeah it's just been you know probably over 10 years of just spending time in the depths of e-commerce which then just keeps swinging into b2b commerce more yeah. and more and more well there's a lot more room to grow right a lot more you know there's a lot less maturity in b2b like you said sometimes huge companies that have zero or Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a very basic first implementation in their own or second version, but it's still not very sophisticated. So absolutely. Yeah, it's very different from the uh, the B2C side. I had a conversation with a friend who works at LL Bean. And years ago I had worked on a B2C e-commerce for them, but it's so long ago now they don't even know how many versions, you know, how many upgrades, yeah. how many platforms they've been on counting yeah. right because it's like what counts as an upgrade versus a new they don't, they don't even remember yeah. like there's no one around <laughs> anymore who remembers when they did their first e-commerce site which is a very different experience as we're saying from a lot of the b2b folks that we're working with today yeah yeah i think that that's that's part of why we're doing this podcast mm -hmm. to kind of help elevate and educate people and hopefully they avoid some of the pitfalls that i think and you've probably seen, I've seen, Tim's seen <laughs> throughout our career. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the implementation side. What um, what were some of the the challenges that you saw back then, or maybe that are you're seeing now um, as folks went to implement a Magento, Hybris, and Optimizely, whatever? You know, there's, there's a lot of options. Yeah, like, there's. Oh, you're Adobe, so I don't want to say too much about the other guys right now but uh... i can talk about all the platforms <laughs> i'm very familiar with all of them um so there's there's a set of challenges that customers face when they're going to implement b2b commerce that are because of the nature of their business and their internal culture and then there are challenges they face because of their technology or their overall strategy for what b2b commerce will be for their business and so the most common pain that I hear from manufacturers and distributors is actually nothing to do with technology. It's the change management, yeah. the staffing, and the expertise of B2B commerce. And you're seeing people move from B2C and retail into B2B commerce implementations because the knowledge and expertise and maturity of B2C and retail e-commerce has some transferable knowledge into large manufacturing distributors. So I think that's a underrepresented issue that companies really do need to consider carefully when they're, you can't just launch, throw up a website and then expect your customers to start using it. If anything, you're going to face more internal conflict that, you know, kind of um, can torpedo the success of your e-commerce strategy because sales reps and even end users don't like that you've changed the process for them. Um, they used to email their their order to their sales rep. They used to send in a fax machine. They have whole teams that that's how they operate and do business with their suppliers. And you're now putting up a B2B e-commerce portal. Um, I've seen some large failures that were executed technically correct, great user experience, no change management, and they do not hit their targets. Yeah, no, um, culture, no culture changes because, yeah, it's a mind. And I think that's the reason B2B commerce is so much harder is that, you know, one, you have more complicated buying processes, ERP integration is more complicated. So it is, I'd say, more complicated from a technology perspective. And it's also way more complicated from a change management perspective because, you know, changing the buying behavior of your customers Theoretically, some might want to buy online. You're changing the buy, uh, the process behavior of your sales reps. You're trying to get alignment across all these different people, and it's it's this. And I think that's what makes it so hard is that the value of it isn't as simple as, "Hey, I have this site that gets more revenue by getting more customers," because there's different kinds of value that go into it. It's it, you have to kind of like figure out how to navigate that. Absolutely. There's so many challenges when it comes to actually 
picking your lane for B2B e-commerce and, and really sizing and scoping your strategy correctly. We're working more and more with manufacturers that have a very broad company-wide imperative and mandate to implement B2B e-commerce. And e-commerce is getting embedded in how business units think about how they generate revenue. It's it's seen as just another channel. It's the same thing that happened in retail. In retail, there was e-commerce was seen as competitive to the stores. And there was a lot of tension between retail e-commerce and the store footprint. And like internally, they hated each other because they felt like they were stealing each other's customers. That maturity has like uh, been absorbed yeah. and there's not, the retailers aren't, don't operate that way anymore. No. But no. we're going through that same idea in B2B commerce where sales reps need to be compensated for web orders. Um, there, there has to be an understanding that this is just how the buyer wants to engage with the business. The business doesn't see channels. The business sees the brand, they see the company and they go to their preferred channel that seems like it's going to be the one to get the task done most efficiently. I think a couple of the things, and, and I'm so glad you, you you brought this up in this way, because a couple of the things that I'm seeing that relate to this are are interesting because, you know, one of the things is as a C-level executives now who uh, are, you know, they're the ones who have actually been in e-commerce in one way or another, participating in it as consumers for decades, right? I mean, so it's interesting now that you know, maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe even a little more recently, you know, you have still had some people who didn't necessarily shop in e-commerce, you know, for a big part of their lives. And now they have, you know, so even if they've shopped primarily in B2C, and now they're the leader of a B2B organization, they want, you know, it, the ability to do these things because they know as a consumer what it's like. And secondarily, I, and I had a conversation about this just this past week, people involved in finance, you know, the people who are actually funding these major companies really want you to be technologically advanced to compete against everybody else who's already investing, right? They want you to now. And so they're not going to invest in you if you're not going to do these things. And so the mandates are really coming from that level now. A few years ago, not not necessarily, but now they are. I mean, they're absolutely yeah. coming from that level. Yeah, the money is definitely flowing from the private equities and the even the public markets of, hey, we want these technologically advanced organizations, even if you're manufacturing widgets or yeah. whatever you're distributing. But I think you said something really interesting, which is like, we've already seen this happen in retail. Like uh, 10, 20 years ago, wherever it was, probably different per organization, there was this like, you know, fight between retail and catalog or whatever and moving online. And it, there was this awkward kind of like culture fit there. And now I think, you know, I almost think you saw an overcorrection where everyone's like, we have to do everything in e-commerce. And then now it's coming back. We're like, you know what? Really better fit is to do omni-channel, right? And I think that same concept applies to B2B, which is it's okay if, you know, Maybe some people still email or call, but like you still need to have a good e-com experience to attract new customers or slowly convert existing customers that maybe get more comfortable buying online over time. And you're seeing the same thing in retail, which is like, we can't just be D2C or we can't just be stores. We need, you know, D2C, we need store, we need buy online, pick up and store, we need stores, we need marketplaces. I mean, if you look at more, a lot of the successful brands, they're multi-channel. Like the, we saw what kind of what happened to the Caspers and the Blue Aprons, most of them. Yeah. You very well. There's, <laughs> there's so many, um, right now it's a toss up internally within these large manufacturers and distributors, particularly manufacturers about who owns e-commerce. Yeah. And it's, I can't predict uh, which next customer I'm going to talk to, where the person who's running e-commerce and what part of the organization they sit in. A third of them are in a marketing function and their job is to generate leads. Mm -hmm. And they're also selling stuff online and they're generating revenue for the business. That's not typically marketing's job is to actually capture yeah. the dollars, yeah. but marketing functions are getting involved in e-commerce. And then there's these business units that, you know, sell a particular line of products and the head of that business unit is seeing 
they've got a sales team underneath them and they want a really good B2B e-commerce experience. And so sales is owning e-commerce. And then the most common denominator is just IT. Sure. It seems like it's just kind of gone to IT to be, cause it's a, it's a more intrusive business application. It's sort of a middle tier. It's a, it's a middle office application. It's not back office ERP, CRM, OMS, PIM. It's, it's this middle yeah. office. But it connects to all those, right? You need to integrate it connects it to all it. those. Yeah. So they kind of take responsibility for e-commerce, but they're not necessarily leading practitioners in user experience or business strategy. They they are beholden to their business stakeholders. Yeah. So that's the most common one I see that really is driving e-commerce or has been handed it by the CEO to the CIO, to some head of IT to say, go implement B2B e-commerce. And so it's, I, I, the more mature companies I'm seeing are starting to really have an e-commerce function and reporting line um, that's going directly up to the CEO. Mm, interesting. And that's, that's what happened in retail there, you know, e-commerce had to become its own um, kind of first class citizen in the org chart. Um, and then it started to get sort of proliferated into every function. Yeah. And I think the same is going to happen in large manufacturers is e-commerce has to kind of rise up the org chart to be a value stream. And then as knowledge gets disseminated, the whole organization can kind of absorb what so e-commerce means. Let's stay on manufacturers for a little bit. And I want to come back to distributors because I think Another problem I see in B2B and just in business in general is everyone thinks they're this special, unique snowflake and what they're dealing with, no one else has figured out before. And it's like almost never the case. I mean, at this point, almost every company I talk to, I'm like, yep, seen that, dealt with something like almost Same everything here. they're dealing with, I've pretty much dealt with in some similar fashion. Maybe it's not exactly that flavor, but it's it's close enough where I can see kind of like the analogy there. Um, with manufacturers, I think they have a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity, but also like challenges around channel management. Cause they can go, okay, they have my B2B customers. Maybe that's straight to distribution, or maybe I cut them out. I've seen some that are going straight to the, um, to the, to the end businesses. So they're, uh, we have even some smaller, you know, brands that are going, Hey, our distributors just aren't cutting it anymore. We're going to go straight B2B to, the end, you know, small business uh, directly ourselves. It's kind of like a direct B2B channel, but then they also have B2C. Sure. How are you seeing people manage like the B2C, the B2B, but also like there's so many variations of that. Um, it's it's all a power dynamic play about who has val who has the most leverage in that manufacturer dealer distributor relationship. Yeah, the I think the argument is resolving at who can provide the best experience to the end customer will yeah. win. They're the ones that, that earn the customer data and earn the order. Um, you know, and that's sort of what Amazon has created is this, like whoever delivers the best experience gets to own the customer and own the order. But some distributors and dealers have way more leverage in some industries than others. Yeah. And some manufacturers have, individual manufacturers have product leadership um, and supply chain leadership so they can push the distributor to play their way. So, you know, a couple of examples, we, we recently launched Toyota Motor North America's site for all of your aftermarket parts for your Toyota car. And there's a strong dealer manufacturer network there. Yeah. So they're, yeah. they launched dealer <laughs> microsites so that you and I, if we own Toyota products and need a part, we're buying it on a dealer site, but it's Toyota's dealer site. Um, so there's this B to B to C yeah, model I've there. Yeah. Uh, think, um, and so that maturity me, is 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 not as common though. I don't I don't see that being executed as well by no. most. I think 3M is doing something similar to that. I think 3M has like a you buy on 3M, but it's through the dealer of 3M, but it's like, yeah, it's that exact same scenario. Um, but, but it has to be exactly what you said, Ed, that the consumer and consumer experience has to be exactly right. I mean, that's the critical piece because 
there could be as many as B to B to B to C's, you know, as you need to in there, as long as the consumer doesn't feel it. As soon yeah. as you feel it and it's like, oh, wait, it's taking longer. Or I have to go through this approval or I have to click that, you know, it, it can't, there can't be extra steps. There can't be extra people. There can't be extra time. You know, none of those things can be involved except behind the scenes, right? Behind yeah. the scenes, anything can happen, but the consumer can never see that. There are a couple of other examples that I think are kind of the forks in the road. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of large manufacturers with international markets go through their distributors and dealers into a market and they won't go around them. Uh, but if they have another market that they see as an opportunity that has no distributor or dealer network or not a strong or mature one, they'll go direct to the end customer in B2B scenarios. So there's this selection of by country, they're choosing how aggressively they sell to the end customer rather yeah. than sell through a distributor or dealer. And they need the option to do both. So that's where they're preserving. I, I think that's been a a neat strategy that kind of resolves the channel conflict that they're, they're not competing in markets where their distributors own the customer. They're enabling the distributor in those markets, but then opening up new revenue with higher margins in other countries. And, and sometimes those manufacturers are buying the distributors as well. That's a, the case of one of the companies that I was working with recently. They were, they were encouraging everybody to kind of upgrade their tech and have better experiences and all this stuff. And distributors who weren't really interested or couldn't do it or what have you, they bought them. And so yeah, they, Unilever, yeah. Unilever bought Food Service Direct, and yeah. that runs on Adobe Commerce, and that's a distributor. But it's yeah. like it's now owned by Unilever, has been for many years. So there's a lot of that M and A activity. There's a lot of, of that happening right, right now. There's a lot. I was surprised at how much I didn't realize until I started having these conversations. I think, I mean, I think that what's interesting, and I think you said a really important point, which is um, that right now it's it's being led by whoever owns the power dynamic but i think that manufacturers should start to think about what more to your point which is who actually adds the most value what process adds the most value to the customer and those two things might be very different so i think that there's a lot of middlemen in the supply chain and the economy that have existed for historical reasons that aren't necessarily relevant to the technologies and the processes we have today. And so they might be appeasing those power dynamics by doing that, but really like that's not actually best for the customer. And they should like, I understand there's a challenge and there's a conflict of trying to move to the other, but if you, you have to get beyond the widget, yeah. the distributor has to add more value in services and solutioning because the manufacturer has the best product data and has the best access to that information that the customer wants. So distributors and dealers have to go beyond just the products that they have in their yeah. supply chain to the end user. They have to add more services and be more value add. And you're seeing that in so many examples. Uh, Watsco is probably our biggest distributor on Adobe Commerce. They do almost $2 billion on our platform. And, yeah. and they're... You talk about everything they're doing. It's not about, they've gone way beyond just search and your price and get it to me uh, on time and 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 reserve my inventory. They're, they're providing value add services, like allowing a contractor to quote a job to fix an air conditioning unit to an end consumer. So like they're providing digital tools to their end customers to quote a project to me if I needed my air conditioner fixed, that creates some stickiness from the contractor to, they're not going to go to the end manufacturer for that service. Yeah. So that's where the superior experience wins the customer, wins the order, and yeah. they grow their business. However, manufacturers, I think the other case that they're tackling first is if 80% of my revenue is coming from my distributor channel, I just need to give my distributors B2B e-commerce. I just need to put a B2B portal up where my distributors place orders with me rather than through the sales rep or through fax. And there's just so, why wouldn't that so be much like EDI though, or why do you see B2B e-commerce as being the better solution? Because I know some of these folks will say, oh, we've got EDI, we don't need that. You know, it's well, I think the web channel scales to customers that don't 
that where they haven't set an EDI connection. So they usually start with their smaller customers where the manufacturer and the distributor haven't invested in that EDI connection because that's an IT yeah. project to set up that EDI relationship. So there's a population of distributors that don't have an EDI channel to the to the manufacturer. And so they put this portal up and it's intuitive and you can use it and you can place your orders and and it's just a better way of engaging with the company and not having to set up individual EDI schemas for every single distributor. But even the larger customers that have distributor EDI integrations, there's a whole population of buyers that don't use EDI. So the manufacturer sees that they can get orders fulfilled faster, invoices paid faster. They can, they can tighten the way they're operating their business. So they make more profit by having an, a B2B e-commerce channel for distributors rather than always just getting that order through EDI um, that might have some latency in it. It doesn't have any merchandising. You're not suggesting any changes in products. You're not consulting the distributor on other values that they could get to expand their spend with you. The, that's the distributor saying, I want these products from you rather than the manufacturer saying you always order these products, but if you consider these other ones and expanding the footprint and wallet share, that's a very common KPI that I hear is the wallet share that the manufacturer has of the distributor's business. So, so talking about wallet share a little bit, I want to pick up on a couple of things that you brought up. For, first of all, I think every distributor who's listening, value add is probably one of the most important terms you can think of. I mean, if you're not adding value, and we've brought this up in other podcasts and other contexts with other guests as well, then, you know, why are you, you know, why do you expect that relationship to continue if you're not adding value? I mean, think about it really blatantly, openly, you know, whatever way raw, you know, that's the raw deal. So that's one thing. The second thing, though, that uh, thinking about the, the manufacturer side of things and value adds on the manufacturer side, what do you see about uh, unique product offerings directly from the manufacturer or unique product uh, customized offerings per distributor, which is something that I've been seeing as well. Do you, could you speak to any of that in uh, the folks? Yeah, um, uh, if manufacturers are selling capital equipment, there's a whole life cycle of how do you service that equipment? How do you have warranty on that equipment? Um can you provide rentals? That's one a project I'm working on right now is the end customer that runs coffee stores, coffee shops, um, doesn't want to buy the capital like equipment coffee. of the coffee machine. They actually want to rent it from this manufacturer. Sure. And so just the idea of creating a rental agreement rather than a, a purchase of capital equipment is is something I'm seeing in that value add that the manufacturer is trying to add value to that distributor or dealer relationship by providing rental options or providing warranty services or um, you know value add service to maintain the equipment in the field. Mm -hmm. um, one customer that we worked with recently is uh, Vestas. They're the manufacturer of wind turbines. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. And so they launched a marketplace for all of the end customers to connect to dealers and distributors. It's a B to B to B site, but it's run like a marketplace because they want to expand the product portfolio to not just service units, but it's all about the host implementation of a wind farm and all the maintenance repair and operations that happen with that equipment. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the manufacturers adding value to both the dealer distributor, giving them a channel to reach sure. more customers and they're providing value to the end user, um, you know, government or utility that's got to maintain this equipment, they can get their products faster and see a, a list of suppliers that could suit their needs. So it's creating some competition between the distributors and dealers, but Vestas is creating the market. And I think that's like the, I've been, piloting this sort of messaging framework for some of these companies to think about is that if you're beginning in this, you transform the experience for your buyers, how they buy from you. If you're a leader, you're going to transform your business, how your business operates with B2B e-commerce. You're going to change fundamentally what size of 
products get shipped out the door from pallets to individual units. You're going to change your business. And then innovators are the ones that are transforming the market. And I think yeah. these marketplaces from manufacturers is where they're, they're changing how the market value chain is oriented. Um, and I think there's a, just a huge shift happening where manufacturers are, are kind of that wave is crashing right now. What do you think that's going to mean for distributors? I think, frankly, I, I think distributors are are pretty vulnerable if they don't they don't step up, they don't they don't change. You know, a lot of them are very legacy businesses that were built on kind of relationships and just call me up and I'll get you everything I need. And I just I'm not sure that's really a compelling value prop for for too much longer. You know, where there's where there's a limited set of products that an end user needs there is risk for the distributor because the manufacturer could easily you know, manufacture and even source on their own all the products that an end user is going to need. So the sure. distributor does start to become irrelevant there. And there's other distributors who will always undercut and it becomes a commodity play and, and you're not adding value. However, the distributors I'm seeing that are succeeding and aren't going anywhere are the ones that have hundreds or thousands of product lines from many different suppliers and manufacturing categories that then funnel into an industry solution. So like water treatment, construction, um, energy, there's so many distributors that serve a market with a diversity of manufacturers that no one manufacturer can, can serve that end customer. Um, so, you know, the, manufacturer of heating and pool equipment is not going to become to replace the value of a distributor who gets heating and pool equipment and concrete and supplies and a whole other host of yeah, products. Yeah, a whole market solution. So it's like so the products, yeah. Yeah, so that's where I think those distributors are more safe cuz and they're pushing the envelope to like I said with that Watsco example provide services that are very bespoke to that industry and the dynamics of that industry is that industry driven by individual contractors who are jobbing their work life. They're, they're doing jobs from week to week and day to day. Um, they're, they're going to home Depot to get supplies or they're coming to this distributor. That person is not going to go to one manufacturer to do their job because they need nuts and bolts. They need big pieces of equipment, they need service views from the distributor. So in that sense, I don't think distributors are going to disappear, but there is a reorientation of the value chain. And um, how do you think they should be using e-commerce or going about e-commerce to add to that value chain as a distributor? I mean, distributors, if you don't have mature B2B commerce, you're so far behind. <laughs> um, like if the manufacturers are doing B2B e-commerce now and they're starting to get their first and second generation in place and you haven't done it, you are behind and there is threat. Um, not necessarily from the manufacturer, but just from other distributors in your category or other distributors in other categories that your customer buys from. So yeah, I mean, you have to get you know, your large catalog on your platform with good search, with customer specific pricing, with quick ordering, and just some of the basic things that that user needs to, one, one distributor I spoke to kind of jokingly shared that the way they think about their e-commerce is like, how do we decrease the amount of time that someone spends on our site? Like our goal is to make the site so easy to use and fit into their work life that they spend a minute on the site, not five minutes. It's like the opposite it's of retail, it's like, the opposite. Like come in and shop and spend all your time. And it's like, no, we're trying to get people to spend as little time as possible on our site because yeah. that means that we're efficient and they're moving on with yeah. their job. And that adds value. That creates brand loyalty with the distributor where it's not about the product or the price. It's just easy to do business with that distributor. And that matters. That creates loyalty that that kind of has a halo effect from that individual to other peers in the industry or just their whole company just buys from that distributor now. I mean, one thing that, that's happened that I've seen, and I've, I've worked in a lot of different categories as our listeners know, but I've worked with people in food service, restaurant supply, a number of players in that space. And, and there used to be many, many more distributors as there were in, you know, a lot of these different categories. 
And there's been consolidation and what have you, and the manufacturers have been more involved directly. But one of the things I think is interesting that I've seen there, and I don't know how much this has spread to other areas, is that there are partnerships among distributors, right? This, this is something mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting, where it's like, let's say you were the distributor for all you know dishes and flatware and cutlery or whatever for a restaurant, right? And there are people who specialize very heavily in stuff like that. Instead of like, you know, getting all of the new relationships to do all of the dining room furniture or whatever is needed for that restaurant, they just partner. And then they have uh, semi-exclusive partnerships and they merge their websites or they cross over from the website. So they're saying, you're looking for furniture? Here's our partner, right? You're looking for your uniforms for your wait, you know, wait staff and chefs. Here's our partner. You're looking for, and I find that very interesting because that's something that didn't really exist a, a while back. There was so much competition and so much of this like wall, you know, that people were building around. Have you seen more? Yeah, those are those are. Areas? Yeah, I think those then just become acquisition targets for yeah. one or the <laughs> other distributors. Yes. Or like get get closer and create partnerships because distributor A has a competitor that sells those other lines of products. And mm -hmm. so they definitely don't want to recommend their competitor sure. um, to go and get the same products, you know, the product to fill the line gap of their product catalog. So they find an exclusive distributor that's kind of niche in one area that doesn't sell competing yeah. products and they create that partner. That makes sense um, from a business strategy standpoint. And then that's where you see so much consolidation. The it's it's interesting to see how long the long tail is in distributor footprints. Like there's always a few very big distributors in most markets, but then there's such a high count of long tail distributors that are working in one geography or one particular product line or one product line in one geography. They're so niche to mm -hmm. serving a market. And and they're not necessarily very expensive acquisitions and for those larger distributors. So I think that's going to continue to be the case is, you know, large distributors need to canvas the whole market they're trying to serve and new markets. And M&A is a way that they they buy those customers, mm -hmm. they buy those supply chains, and then they fold it into their e-commerce experience. That happens a lot. I mean, Watsco is basically for e-commerce websites mm -hmm. that have been acquisitions over time. Um, the same was another customer of ours, SRS distributors. Um, you know, they they have their their whole business strategy is MA, is you know, go and buy these companies and then fold them into one experience um, and drive the user to the right type of business that they're trying to buy from. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to just touch on a very specific topic. I think um, a few actually um, tactical stuff. Um, so um, you mentioned customer specific pricing and, and that's important. We noticed that uh, that's actually a lot harder than I think people think it is to solve for many manufacturers and distributors because they may have very complex pricing in their ERP. We see a lot of these ERPs, they have their own super crazy complicated pricing logic and trying to just like sync that over and store it in the econ platform isn't necessarily great because now you have like, you know, whatever, 100,000 products, 10 times 10,000 companies, each has their own pricing table. You have this like massive, you know, pricing record that needs to kind of sync over uh, one way we've solved that is doing a real-time lookup. So it's, it's almost like a headless. So we've done a kind of like a headless approach where it just does a kind of a real-time lookup, um, but um, it doesn't necessarily actually have to be headless. But I think ultimately we found that that's like a much harder technical pro problem to solve than I think people give credit to. They're just like, oh, make my price. We'll more. just call the ERP. We'll just create yeah. this huge dependency on yeah, exactly. a, a, a usually slow and not performance system. Exactly. Yeah. The um, prices are so slow. And then it's like try loading that on a category page or a search results page, you know, just doesn't work very well. So yeah, I'm just curious if you've seen that be a technology challenge that I think people. Yes. All the time. Yeah. I mean, it, within our platform, the way that you, set up customer specific pricing had some deficiencies in it where basically every 
customer price book you created duplicated the entire catalog, whether the customer had unique pricing for that product. So if you have a base catalog of a million SKUs and, but only five or 1% is actually negotiated contract pricing with a, with customer one, two, or three, we would duplicate all million SKUs, even though the price is exactly the same for every customer. Cause those areas of the product catalog don't get negotiated. We fix that by removing that duplication. So we simplify the SKU count down um, cause ultimately the e-commerce platform does need to have some more intelligence in it about the customer's contract available products and their price associated with them. Otherwise you end up in a real time call situation and that creates technical debt that then creates performance issues that you never end up resolving. Yeah, or you, have to, you have to create like a middleware layer. So in this case, there is a... Yeah create a Redis cache of the yeah. price tables and like then, in, and then, and now you've got a custom application yeah. sitting between ERP and web and, and you've just created. Yeah. Well, in this case, there's more like complexity filter on that. So it can work well. I think if there's a company dedicated to that, but this is a very specific ERP product company that only works with one specific ERP version. So it wouldn't work for anything else outside of that. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, it, it, it doesn't work for other ERPs, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, these are just like, to your point, like there's not an easy solve. And then I think the problem is people just assume that these connectors will solve it. So they go around and they go, all right, well, these guys have a connector, right? And the connector is going to solve that problem. But I've only seen, you know, the connector we built with that company does actually solve it, but it's because they built this like really sophisticated middleware product. But I've I've almost never seen the connectors actually solve this problem. The, the other connectors in the market, this yeah, particular. they don't just necessarily. Um, yeah, they they because there's so many edge cases and unique fields, requirements, um, error handling. There's so many different things that you need to consider how you're going to get data in and out of these systems. That middlewares often don't fill the requirements unless they're simple right out of the box. Yeah. So, so I, I, I connector middleware version, mm -hmm. whatever the what they want. Yeah. I would say about half, maybe more than half, maybe like 60% of our larger B2B commerce implementations rely heavily on real-time calls for not just for pricing, but sometimes even for customer data, for credit checks, for is is there inventory in this warehouse? They started the cart, mm -hmm. they started building the order, you know. 30 seconds ago, two minutes ago, now they're in cart. Do we check to make sure there's still inventory there? Um, so there's definitely that, that is a requirement. Um, and it, there's value in having real time calls, but I think it becomes over engineered uh, and it's an, sometimes an oversimplification of the problem. So I want to see our customers store more of that pricing logic in the e-commerce platform because then it you don't have to then create those calls sure. and manage that technical debt uh, but it's a there's there's trade-offs to both of those approaches the cultural change too right going back to change management you know yeah some yeah. companies just won't they they don't want their anything other than their erp to like manage or really control pricing um you know, they don't, they don't want to create those systems of reference in the e-commerce system. Um, so yeah, I, I, integrating with the ERP and CRM is the number one technical challenge of implementing B2B commerce time and, and time and time again. And, you know, I'll just interject this because, you know, if there's ever a drinking game based on this podcast, one of the things that one of the things that's got to come up all the time, in addition to value adds, is <laughs> tiered pricing, right? Every time yeah. I say tiered pricing, I want people to take a drink. So, you know, if folks are listening to this in the future, you know, oh, please do. <laughs> but yeah, please. But, you know, same here, the tiered pricing. But, uh, but there's some, there is, I know that is not a 100% solution. I've worked with so many different people in so many situations. However, they also overcomplicate their lives by having so many, you know, different ways of pricing through either individually by client or 
through salespeople because it's a legacy thing or through some distributor relationship that they signed the deal in 1948 or anything, right? <laughs> All these things. And and really, I keep coming into people, you know, in the engagements that I have, and I'll stand in that boardroom and I'll say, please change your pricing. You know, I'll just really make I it. I think that's fair. It's yeah, that's really, fair. It's really something that needs to just, over time, people take a deep breath and figure out an easier way to do it. And also, I'll just say this, too, because part of the case is that the end consumer is actually less satisfied knowing that there is highly customized pricing because they're always wondering if there's a better deal out there than the B2C consumer where it's more democratic, more. It's not 100% either, but more democratic. Yeah, so it seems like this could be solved but through eventually kind of more algorithmic pricing, right? Like you buy X amount per year, you get, you know, this amount yep. of discount and exactly. like 80% of customers, you know, that probably makes sense in that, you know, you have more of a standardized pricing mechanism versus, it's also probably really hard to control uh, the um, the margins and the processes when everyone has free reign to change price on a whim. <laughs> So, uh, so Ed, did we lose you completely? Is it gonna? Is did it we gonna... lose you, Ed? Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah we lost here. <laughs> can we do? Uh, can you do it without headset, or is that possible? Yeah, you could switch off. It's, it's better than you think. The laptop uh, usually actually provides pretty good uh, audio. Let's see if uh, switching off works. This is uh, exciting. This is happening live, people. It's happening <laughs> live for, for you guys. Oh, there it goes. There, you're back. So wonderful. Yeah. Um, that's how much I'm working is that this headset can't. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, you really, you know, I think you're right about that. This this pricing integration, just one little simple feature that sounds so simple, but it's just like one example of one of the features within an integration project. It's just so much more complicated than I think these companies think. Um, so I think real-time pricing and just the integration in general is always a lot harder than I think people think in terms of making it a good experience for the customers. Um, the other one that I see is, is harder is uh, availability, shipping, making sure that those costs are accurate. Do I get LTL? Do I get freight? Do I get their oh, yeah. trucks? Do I get someone else's trucks? Do I get UP? Like all the variables that go into getting shipping, you know, processed and quoted correctly is, is harder than people think. And uh, representing one order that's going to yeah. have multiple shipments to multiple locations with different shipping terms per, yeah. per sub sub shipment within the order. Um, yeah. We worked with a large manufacturer, uh, sealed air, um, and they make packaging equipment a lot for a lot of e-commerce companies that use their, kind of packaging solutions to send e-commerce orders. Ironically, they have an e-commerce website to buy that stuff through distributors. And the way they have to represent their bill to and shipped to methods and then create one order, they're, they're having to recreate the complexity of their business on a web page. And they, I think, Timothy, to your example earlier, like there's this tension between how much is your business process just so complex that mm -hmm. you're you're creating your own problems yeah. versus how much is that complexity valuable and needs to just be represented in the web well, experience? Here's the problem that I see is we see a lot of them. We work a lot in the mid market. So I think mid market, especially as these challenges where they don't they aren't the big guys, they don't have 20 people in IT. Plus they can go hire Accenture and spend $3 million on the econ platform. And so they want, they, they don't want to change the complexity that they've created, but they can't afford to build that complexity into e-commerce because when they get a real quote or they get the real pricing of what it takes to do that, the costs of managing and maintaining all this stuff is more than what their business can afford because they're not, they're not okay. generating enough revenue and profit to justify it. So yeah. do they simplify their business requirements to fit, uh, to move? I think they should. Should. I don't like, think that they necessarily uh, are realizing that fast enough. I think they will either 
realize it and do it and simplify the business or they will eventually probably go out of business. <laughs> like those are like the two two options I think that'll eventually happen, you know, in those in those two scenarios. I agree with you, Isaiah. I want to just say this out loud too. I mean, I've I keep bumping into a lot of different clients of mine where it is that sort of over com complex I can't, I can't think of the word. What's the opposite of simplification, right? The, it's the over complexitization. Over engineered, over engineered. Over engineered. You know, there's there's something there that needs to happen. In fact, one of the uh, B2B concerns that I'm working with, so I can't mention them right now, but they know who they are. You know, we actually had to form a, a little committee to figure out how to simplify things that were going on in the business. The processes need to change before all of the tech can address, you know, the issues to help them you know, do better and compete and make more, you know, it's really process. Well, that's, that's the problem is they're like, we want, you know, best in class B2B commerce platform, but our entire budget is a hundred grand. And it's like, how are you going to do real time pricing calls, you know, ERP integration, get all your product catalog, design developments, every, like there's just so many costs that can go into this stuff. Not that you can't do a project for a hundred grand. It's just like what you get for a hundred grand might just be very different than the level of sophistication that they're expecting. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. now you have to bring your expectations down to what you're actually going to get for a hundred grand. Large or small, uh, you know, I don't think this ma that matters as much, but you know, there's just a, another zero in a lot of these projects yeah. where it's a hundred thousand exactly. dollars for a several million dollar company or a million dollars for a multi-billion dollar company. Sure. Generally the way that I see the more mature companies um resolve that is that they really focus their pilot or first implementation on a more narrow use case yeah they don't try to boil the entire ocean of For every sure. customer they could sell any product to they they pick a product line they pick a com a country they pick a use case and that's why manufacturers have focused so much on aftermarket parts and service because it's not threatening to their distributor relationships. It's it's something that is costing their company business to always, yeah. or costing the company money to always be on the phone, yeah. placing these repeat orders. So yeah. that's why it's like resolved. Like, can we just get that going well? <laughs> see yeah. some operational efficiency, see some uptick in sales and then reinvest. Yeah. Uh, I think that's... That's what I see in large and small companies. The ones that succeed. That do it well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Right? Like, how can we, I think a good solution, especially for distributors, is how can we automate or bring the long tail orders, like let's say the sub thousand dollar orders online. You know, if you're taking a call or an email and manually processing, you know, a $300 order, it's probably not very profitable, right? Like manpower wise, customer, you know, so that's where it's like, okay, how do I, how do I go? And, and maybe you don't need real time pricing calls for that, right? If they're placing smaller orders, maybe we just do tiered pricing or kind of customer group pricing for phase one and we'll deal with contract pricing in phase two, right? Tier, tier yeah. point. Yeah. That's we've the way to, distributors you know. do exactly that where they even, you know, publish public pricing of some of their more commoditized products that yeah. aren't as differentiated or you know in the chemical space i've worked with some distributors that are they're trying to reach customers they've never sold to before with yeah. seo strategies to drive yeah. net new customers that the company would never even consider putting a sales rep against um and then that sort of grows into a longer term relationships so that that long tail is also another good strategy to focus your b2b commerce initiative rather than uh, trying to serve every customer it's like let's take this one segment at a time yep um we're getting towards the end here so we'd like to give people kind of a chance to uh, you know what advice you know going through all these different challenges what advice do you have for when you kind of already just gave it, but any additional advice <laughs> or or thoughts or concerns that you would, you know, have people think about in this journey that that maybe they underestimate? You know, there's, there's too many um, to think of, but what I'm observing just recently, not that it's not been a trend for a long time, but just the 
the oversimplification of associating your B2B e-commerce channel with what Amazon does. Um, you know, I just, I hear that a lot is, you know, I want my website to be like Amazon. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, they do that so well. And I think it's important to recognize that Amazon and some of the leading brands and businesses that you buy from online are, have been doing this for some as more as 20 years with dedicated internal user experience, engineering, product management. There's a sophistication to how they're able to deliver those experiences. So I guess my parting advice is don't make your e-commerce strategy like it's going to become Amazon on day one. Um, and or really, even year really, one or even year two, it's like, you're just not going to get there, right? Like that's not how you're going to compete, you know? And you can still, and you don't need that. I think that's the thing that needs to be reassured. Customers need to be reassured about is you don't need to be Amazon because your customers, maybe if you're a distributor are buying from Amazon, but if you look at your peer set, that's really the more appropriate comparison to make is look at your peers and see where you can provide those handful of features or experiences that are going to make your customer so delighted that you made their life easier to do business with you and, and trust that that's going to pay dividends. It does in so many cases. Wouldn't you say if, that, if their goal is to be like Amazon, shouldn't they just sell on Amazon? Just start, you know, if that's their, their strategy. Like, why don't you just use that as your Amazon strategy, right? Sell on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Walmart or whatever. You know, that's, that's hyper competitive and you got to get good at that. So you got to pick your, you got to pick where you're going to, where you're going to be good. And I think, or where, where you need to be great, I think is probably the more appropriate framing is like, what is the 10% of things that you know, you need to be excellent at and forget everything else because you're just, you're never going to be able to be excellent at everything. No. Um, so like really focus your priorities on the few things that are going to really drive the value. You know, thank, thank you for that. And, and, you know, I, I think one of the other strings of thing, uh, you know, just to pull from something else that you had said earlier, it's also just really about listening to, you know, who your customers are. I, I really feel like, you know, that's a key thing that we've all said in different ways throughout this. And, yes. and it's very, it's very critical. If you don't know, what your customers, your end consumer, your whoever they are in between really want, then you're not going to succeed either. So it's not just saying make me like Amazon or, you know, all of these other things that, uh, you know, the companies will say. It's really just understanding that. Talk to them. Have whole focus groups, you know, have a retreat. There, there's a company I work with. They have uh, top client retreats uh, every year. They invite, uh, they invite a whole bunch of people and they say, you know, they thank them, they give a big meal, a big party, and then they say, well, tell us more, you know, tell us more yeah. about what we should be doing. And I think that's a great way to approach things. Yeah, yeah. it's really smart. Mm -hmm. Probably makes them happy too, right? Get some free food, free meal, have a good time, and they get all the advice well, from the customers. <laughs> these are customers who spend hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. So you know what? They can have a nice little meal once in a while, right? <laughs> yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, really great. <laughs> I think it's great. That's a good idea. <laughs> So Ed, Ed, uh, any parting words? Thank you so much for being our guest today. Anything else yeah, you'd like to say? fun. I hope to come back on uh, episode, before episode 1000. So maybe <laughs> in the 200s, but you know. I hope maybe 203, 204, yeah. you know, 100 from now. We'll yeah, we'll we'll definitely need product updates. You know, you made a really good point about how you guys have simplified the catalog, mm -hmm. shared, shared catalog feature around pricing. So we love to have people back because things are changing so fast, right? In a year or even two years, the future. I suspect I will have some product news from Adobe <laughs> in the coming six months in, in that area. So I was, I would hope so. <laughs> Please, yep, absolutely. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, thanks for having thanks, me. Guys.